There have been many drug casualties in the history of rock. Shannon Moon, Janis Joplin, Gigi Allen to name a few. These are musicians who we actually lost to drugs who are probably in heaven playing harps. But what about the musicians such as Sid Barrett who stayed with us mere mortals, living to an older age and whose minds were too fractured to continue making good music? Today, we'll be diving deep into the life of an underrated musician most of you have probably never heard of named Alexander Skip Spencer. He was in Jefferson Airplane for a hot minute. He played with the underrated psychedelic rock pioneers Moby Grape. He developed a serious drug addiction and was so strung out on LSD, he axed his fellow bandmate's hotel room door down. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to the one, the only, Alexander Skip Spence. Big thanks to my pal Eli for the suggestion. So grab your flippers, fasten your seatbelt, and put the LSD away so the kids don't get into it. Smash the like button with the paddle you keep under the couch, and don't forget to subscribe. On this channel, we post tune tales on Fridays and music on Tuesdays by yours truly. And a big thank you to all my amazing Patreons. You guys are legends. Now, without further ado... Alexander Skip Spence was born in Windsor, Ontario on April 18, 1946. His dad was a solo singer-songwriter and piano player and a famous bomber pilot. In the mid-50s, his family moved to San Jose, California, and his parents bought him his very first guitar. This changed his life. The mid-60s rolled around and Skip skipped off to San Francisco to audition for The Other Side. He was accepted, and as it turns out, their rehearsal space was in a bar called The Matrix, which was owned by Marty Ballin. Marty had just started up a little band called Jefferson airplane. Marty was looking for a new drummer for the band. Marty Ballin saw Skip at the bar and he was struck by his looks. Skip had never played the drums. He just looked good. Marty Ballin gave him a pair of drumsticks and told him to go home and practice. He co-wrote two songs with Ballin for their debut, Jefferson Airplane Takes Off. They kicked him out of the band because he missed a gig. He took two hot babes and went to Mexico for a vacation without telling his bandmates. So he was unceremoniously cut from the band. However, his track, My Best Friend, made it onto Surrealist Pillow long after Skip departed. It was the first single from the album and it went nowhere, sinking like a stone. Jefferson Airplane had fired their manager for good reason, which I'll get into later. His name was Matthew Katz. Skip Spence and Matthew Katz both got the boot from Jefferson Airplane. Katz began pushing Spence to form a new band. So in no time, Moby Grape was formed. But tragedy was in the cars from the beginning. First of all, their manager, Matthew Katz, was fired by Jefferson Airplane for a reason. He was a greedy, manipulative piece of work who wanted the lion's share for himself. He was the quintessential manager with dollar signs in his eyes. He got the band to sign over their name to him, which meant the members could never explore their own legacy. Katz knew he had a talented band under his wing, so in the beginning, he paid for their apartments and living costs. In turn, they ended up feeling indebted to him. So when a contract was drawn up, instead of seeking outside legal advice, they went with it. They spent eight hours a day in October of 1966 rehearsing their songs. They had elaborate pop harmonies, and the difference between Moby Grape and the other psychedelic bands of the era was that Moby had three-minute songs. Their songs were trippy, but they were tight. They also had three guitarists, which allowed for some pretty interesting melodic interplay between the instruments. Skip wrote some of their most innovative songs, experimenting with studio effects and using unconventional song structures. They signed to Columbia Records and released their debut in June of 1967. What should have been the beginning of a beautiful and illustrious career was actually the beginning of many bad decisions and bad luck that killed both the band and sent Skip into a spiral of madness and psychedelia. The first thing that went wrong was that Columbia released 10 of the songs as five singles all released on the same day. Of all these songs, only Ohama and Hey Grama charted. Essentially, this meant that all the songs from the album were competing against each other, which is a pretty nonsensical way to release an album, if you ask me. As a result, the songs from the album got very little airplay. Despite the overexposure and the poor release strategy, the response was positive and the album was a critical darling. It was referred to as the ancestral link between psychedelia, country rock, glam, power pop, and punk. Rolling Stone called it fresh and exhilarating. The record release was also a huge, overblown disappointment. They had 700 bottles of wine, but no corkscrew, which led to many disappointed guests who were looking forward to getting smashed with the band. 10,000 orchids also fell from the ceiling, and the partygoers were slipping and sliding all over the place. The next day, the band was charged with the delinquency of minors after underage groupies were discovered in the band's car. 
Luckily, the charges were dropped, but not after some pretty bad press. See, as a consequence of the bad press, the East Coast tour was cancelled. Not to mention Matthew Katz messed up the dates for an important photo gig. Moby Grape moved from San Francisco to LA to make their second album, but they were already starting to fall apart at the seams. They were knee-deep in the cliché rock and roll party lifestyle. This is the period when Skip really began to experiment with hallucinogens. Skip pulled another disappearing act, heading off with some serious drug heads for a few weeks. According to bandmate Jerry Miller, he returned a changed man. He was shirtless and shaved with a leather jacket, chains, and he was sweating like a pig. There was something dark about him. The light had gone from his eyes. One day, Skip grabbed an axe and went searching for the band's drummer, Don Stevenson. He went to the hotel where Don was staying. He threatened the doorman and then took the lift up to the 52nd floor where he axed down the hotel room door. The cops wrestled him to the ground and carted him off to jail. Skip had taken so many hallucinogens and he fried his brain to such a point where he was convinced he was the Antichrist. A few weeks earlier, he had also attacked Columbia's art director with scissors. He was taken to a prison called The Tombs and then began a six-month internment to Bellevue Hospital where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was never the same after this. The old Skip, the fun Skip, the light Skip, he was gone forever in a dope-induced psychosis. Moby Grape was also never the same after this. Not to mention their album, Wow, did not wow the critics. It was a nonsensical mess. It was meandering, it was unfocused. Two mediocre albums later, the band called it quits. They tried regrouping several times over the years in various formations, but since Matthew Katz owned the name, they had to use different names, which of course made it tricky to reach their old school fans. So the band essentially burned brightly for one album, and less than a year before everything imploded. Also, due to their arrangement with Matthew Katz, they hadn't seen a penny from the royalties, and they never did. By the time Skip was admitted to the psych ward, everyone had written him off. The drugs and madness killed his creativity, they said. However, the opposite was actually true. Bellevue gave him the peace and quiet to write a prolific amount of material. Hence, the moment Skip left the hospital, dressed in cat pajamas, he jumped in his car and he drove down to Nashville, where he spent three days holed up in a recording studio, making his first and only solo album. Or, he played every instrument himself. The songs are at once brilliant yet chaotic, and they sound unfinished at times. Mike Mettler of Guitar Player calls the album a textbook example of how to record the disintegration of a mind. It is a difficult album. The mental illness is woven throughout with imagery of demons and saints and bizarre lyrics that Skip often muffles in his delivery. The production is haunting and beautiful. I can see how Columbia didn't see any hits on it, mind you. But they went a little too far. See, he released it on Columbia Records on May 19th, 1969. Columbia didn't promote this album at all. It is the lowest selling album in Columbia Records history, and it was deleted from the Columbia catalog within a year of its release. 30 years have passed since Orr was released. Spence started experimenting with heroin and along with the coke, psychedelics, and alcohol. This meant that he was barely there, both physically and mentally. He withdrew from his bandmates and his friends. He never officially left Moby Grape, but during the last few years of his existence, Spence wasn't really in the band anymore. He was just kind of lingering on the sidelines. We couldn't have him there. He'd pace the room, describing axe murderers. So the band got him a place of his own. His drug and alcohol abuse meant that he ended up with many more stays in the psych ward over the years. He OD'd once, he ended up in the morgue, and he surprised the morgue technician by waking up and asking for a glass of water. The morgue technician must have thought he was on the set of Night of the Living Dead. In fact, Skip did so much that he'd shock people around him by doing giant chunks of it. But due to his high tolerance, he wouldn't even get high. He also had a rat named Oswald, who also snorted coke. I kid you not. The 70s and 80s were rough. He was often homeless where he stayed with friends. Eventually, he lucked out and found a trailer to live in. He never washed his dishes and he lived in squalor. At one point in the 90s, he tried convincing some of the grammar school girls to go to his house. Their parents got him committed to the psych ward once again. At this point, he also lost his precious trailer and he was homeless again. Well, while all this is quite sad, during all these years, Orr had become a cult favorite. Even though the artist behind it was mentally too far gone to make music, living largely on the street or in mental hospitals, a number of musicians got together and made More Orr, a tribute to the Skip Spence album, in 1999, 30 years after Orr's debut. From Beck to Mudhoney and Robert Plant, this was a star-studded album that paid homage to one of Psychedelia's most underappreciated bright lights. A man who succumbed to his demons, burned out too soon, and ended up a victim of addiction and mental illness. Skip Spence lay in the hospital dying of lung cancer on April of that year when his son came in and played him the album. 
I like to think it put a smile on his face. He passed away on April 16th, 1999, two days before his 53rd birthday. <laughs>